So I uh, was more than glad to present this. Uh, this project that Trina's worked on relates to our bigger project. We have a native medicinal plant project in the Great Plains focused on Kansas in which we've uh, convinced our bioscience authority to give us the money to look at native plants. And this has been valuable to us uh, for several reasons. Um, but two honoring reasons which relate to this organization is, first of all, having worked on ethnobotanical information uh, across the Great Plains, worked with many native tribes, this is a great opportunity to actually honor and justify traditional ecological knowledge by looking at native plants that native peoples used for their chemistry. And then secondly, I'm uh, quite the ardent uh, prairie uh, enthusiast uh, and like to talk to people about the importance of prairie plants. And so, uh, get this right. So we've got uh, a major collection pro program going on, and we also grow plants out in our garden. We've got a staff people here, and this is the research garden we have at uh, the University of Kansas. But most of our work is collecting plants across the Great Plains. We also do educational work. Um, this is one of the groups that came out, and we gave them a tour and talked to them about the importance of plants and uses and native native uses of plants. For our wild collections, we dry them, um, which is really great to have old labs that have fume hoods, which are extremely energy inefficient, but by changing the air in your room every two hours um, or less, you quickly dry plant materials. So we've collected now uh, over 200 species of plants that we've uh, ran through various bioassays. We have a high throughput screening facility at the university. But the heart of what we do is this Prairie Ethnobotany Database. Um, this started with work that I've done and published in my two books, uh, Ebel Wild Plants and Medicinal Wild Plants of the Prairie. And so we took all that information and put it into the structured database so that we could uh, order, sort, um, look at the information in various ways. And so one of the questions that, that came up um, for us kind of backwards in a way, is I had justified this program with the state by saying we really need to look at prairie plants because they've not been looked at for their uses. There's not been a lot of chemistry work really on most plants in the United States, if you think about it. Um, but perhaps prairie plants are a little unique or different because it's a high light environment and because there's lots of stress. So we believe that secondary compounds, uh, the things that make that are medicinal, uh, are increased when there's stress on plants. That plants with stress do not want to be eaten by insects or other things. And so if you have a highly stressful environment, um, bright light, uh, periodic rain, not enough rain, you might have more plants that are medicinal. So we thought we would look at this issue of of how many plants are medicinal and look at their uses. The database allows us to sort things We've used these sorts in terms of, of looking for lists of plants to collect. We've been particularly interested in wound healing, anti-cancer activity, uh, antioxidants. And so we've actually used keyword searches in the ethnobotany. Now that is fraught with problems because uh, the keywords are the words of the people who collected the data, be it anthropologists, ethnobotanists, uh, historians, historical figures. So you have some problems in interpreting, um, but it's still, still very, very useful. So if you look at the uh, proportions of medicinal and non-medicinal plants in Kansas, of the over 2,200 plants in Kansas, and the reason why we took Kansas, it was nice to take something in the center of the Great Plains. The boundaries don't matter so much, but the boundaries allow us to have a specific list. If we try to take the whole Great Plains, you would get a lot more plants that are truly Rocky Mountain plants, but a few have come out into the plains. So it allowed us to have a, a fairly specific list. So if you look at this percent, it's pretty typical, pretty obvious. In work I've done looking at uh, edible and medicinal plants that are just of prairie habitats, that ratio is you have about 225 medicinal plants to about 100 edible plants which is similar to that ratio right there. If you look at uses um, in our database, 
um, medicine, medicinal uses, is the highest number. Again, you're getting a fairly similar breakout to what you saw previously. About 37% to food being 22%. And you have a whole list of other uses. We also took data. We uh, worked with Dan Warman. And Dan was willing to send us information for the species that were in Kansas. So we actually added information to the data I had originally. And we've, of course, continued to look at information that uh, we found more recently, historical accounts, and in some cases, more recently published accounts. So if you look at our database, the species in Kansas that have the most uses and this a use is a hit, which means that if you're talking about white sage, this would be a use by one tribe for one type of use. So if you had a, a report that the Omaha and Ponca, such as Gilmer would talk about, used white sage for uh, stomach problems, that would be two separate uh, uses. Or if you had that the Omaha and Ponca used white sage for intestinal troubles and as a wash for the skin, that would be four different uses. So we separate out all of these for individual uses. And when you do this, you look at those. These are the most common uses used plants uh, in the Great Plains. Not all of those are native. Acris calamus is now taxonomic confusion. Uh, that species is considered European and, and Acris americanus is now considered the American species, but the ethnobotany is confused because most of it's recorded as calamus. Mm -hmm. Rumex crispus is European Eurasian plant weed. Most of the rest of these, though, not all of them, most of them are native plants. So white, white sage has both a medicinal and ceremonial plant use. We've removed the ceremonial plant uses from our database for this analysis to try not to confuse them. So if the plant was used only as a smudge, um, we removed that as a medicinal use. We took kind of a very narrow health medicinal use. Not that we're not interested or don't support those other uses, but we're trying to look at links for actual medicinal uses. As an aside, we uh, are uh, very fortunate in Lawrence to also have Haskell Indian Nations University, one of two pan-tribal uh, colleges in the United States, federally funded. Any Native American student can go there. We had an opportunity to work with our cultural center. These are plannings that I got to work on with Wright Sage on the far right, kind of leaning over the cement there, and Acris calamus, which is an important plant still across the Great Plains. One of the plants that I take up to the Rosebud Reservation when I go up to visit friends and colleagues up there, very much appreciated as a medicine for people who are sick and debility. So I mentioned we use Dan Mormon's database. If you don't make use of this, it's a very handy, easy tool for typing in your species name or tribal name um, or use, and lots of things will pop up. So uh, Dan previously uh, put together a paper looking at the percentage of what species uh, families were used uh, in his database. And his database is uh, uh, United States and Canada, so north of Mexico. And of course, the question is, are, are, is there select families? Of course there is, rather than just random use. We all know that here. That would be the null hypothesis. And he made the comments made that no one ever really finds a new use. These are all known. In a certain sense, I would echo that too. Although, uh, as one of the problems, if you're interested in anti-cancer plants, of course, cancer is really, uh, I think, pretty much a, a construction of our pharmaceutical companies and modern medicine. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next talk. But, so you don't find lots of records of anti-cancer uh, plants. What you might find if there's a skin cancer thing is something for the skin or skin problems. Lung cancer more likely to be a lung uh, medicine of some sort. So we did some statistics here and looking at uh, percentages of medicinal plants within each family. Um, and particularly interested in those things that ranked most highly. Uh, and what you see here is percentages. Uh, the Ranunculaceae uh, has across the plains. 
uh, a lot of low growing plants, uh, everything from uh, mouse tails to uh, anemones, lots of different species um, like the high light, the Lamiaceae, mint family, lots of mints, Monardas, Mentha, others, APAC, carrot family, Lomatiums, uh, lots of, of, of plants in that family. Asteraceae, which is the abundant family, the most abundant family, lots of goldenrods, lots of species of goldenrods and asters, highlight species. Um, these are Asteraceae radiated, you know, up from Central uh, America, Mexico, into the bright light, heat tolerant plains. And as you can see here on the, the bottom, the Cyperaceae, the Poaceae, the Graminoids, very abundant in the Great Plains. But as we all know, uh, grasses for the most part do not have a lot of secondary compounds. Grasses, of course, are different in how they protect themselves. They've evolved to be eaten, so they're not quite as interested in not being eaten. Their growing tips are at the bottom instead of at the top, and they're renewing themselves. So not at all surprising that Cyperaceae, Poaceae, are exceptionally low. Don't worry about these numbers too much in late afternoon. Um, but essentially the, the take home message is that we indeed did find that there were more species in bright light environments and in those families, the asteroids, as I was just mentioning that list, uh, percentage wise than a random look at the flora and that our uh, percentage numbers, because these bright light environments differ from the, more, the norm that uh, Mormon discovered when he looked at this. We also have done more than one type of statistical analysis to try to figure out some of the problems you have with, obviously in some plant families you don't have many species. Other plant families, again like the Asteraceae, you have large numbers. So we've had to take some of that into account. A couple last points here. We also looked at growth form. Um, and as is not surprising, <laughs> trees do not uh, represent a large portion of the prairie flora, although there are trees. Um, we're more of a forb herb graminoid uh, landscape. And so you find more uses of plants in those categories than you would find in, in other habitats. Thank you, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Yeah, great.